Hello and welcome to Storehouse 7 Ministries with me, Chris Wickland. Today we're looking through our Through the Book of Revelation series and today we're on chapter 13 and episode 3 of chapter 13. So let's get straight to it. So Revelation 13 verse 6. And he, that's the beast, opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is those who dwell in heaven. <clears throat> As you have read and listened to this commentary, you will note that I state that atheism will not exist at the time of the end of the age. Look at this verse we've just read. The beast blasphemes against God, blasphemes his name and his heavenly tabernacle where all the angels and all the church who have died throughout the ages live. The beast in his speeches is always railing against God in heaven. If atheism were a thing, he would not waste his time talking about a God that doesn't exist. The beast hates God, hates heaven and hates his saints who live in heaven and upon the earth. For those who would use this text as a proof text for a pre or mid trib rapture, please be aware that heaven is already filled with billions of Christians who have died and gone to be with Christ throughout the ages. (coughs) Excuse me. Revelation 13 verse 7. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. You'll notice that halfway through the tribulation, everything seems to be stepping up a gear. Why? Because remember, Satan has now been kicked out of both the third and second heaven is now stuck on the earth. Where am I getting this from? This is from Revelation 12, 12. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, plural, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth (coughs) and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time left. So Satan needs to use a human now to exercise his will, to do his bidding, and thus gives his authority to the pseudo-Christ, the false Christ, the antichrist, to execute his will. Now that Satan is no longer lord of the air and has no power or, or influence in that zone, He now wants to inflict his wrath upon the saints upon the earth. Why? So he can get back at God by poking the apple of his eye, which is his saints, the church and the unsaved people of Israel, who will finally come to Messiah at the end of the tribulation period at the fullness of the times of the Gentiles. See Romans 11.25. This also fulfills prophecies which the prophet Daniel wrote about. Daniel 7.25. He, the beast, will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given unto his hand for a time, times, and half a time, i.e. three and a half years. So this all seems hopeless and desperate for the church, but let's read on in Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 26 to 28a. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. Now notice how the greatness of all the nations under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. This is part of our inheritance as Christians. It says in Revelation 2.26, He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. Revelation 20 verse 4, And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 5.10, you have made them the saints to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. So some encouraging words for us as we're going through, you know, when the church goes through that difficult tribulation period, they can look forward to their inheritance where they shall rule and reign over the earth with Christ. Revelation 13 verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Now, this passage opens with the interesting phrase, all who dwell upon the earth. 
Now this at first glance looks like the pre-rapture saints are in heaven whilst all the evil people are on the earth. However, the term or phrase people living on the earth or upon the earth is actually an Old Testament phrase. And remember, we're always using the Old Testament as the cipher to decode the uh, apocalyptic understanding of revelations from the book of Revelation. Remember, the key component to understanding the book of Revelation is by finding its counterpart from the Old Testament. And this way of study unlocks a lot of mysteries. In this commentary, you will have noticed that I have been pulling a lot from the book of Daniel, for example. And this is because the prophecies of the book of Revelation are really nothing new. So we need to go back to previous apocalyptic writings of the Old Testament to decode those of the New Testament. And that is basically how the book of Revelation works. <clears throat> So to just blindly insert assumptions without understanding the cipher key, uh, which is found in the Old Testament, will often lead one down blind alleys and into possible error. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew phrase Yoshvai Haaretz means inhabitants of the land or inhabitants of the earth. And it has several meanings. Firstly, it is a generic term for the human race. Secondly, for the pagan tribes of Canaan. See Exodus 23, 31, Joshua 2, 9, Jeremiah 47, 2, Nehemiah 9, 24. And thirdly, the Jews in their land of Israel. Jeremiah 6, 12, 10, 18, Hosea 4, 1, Joel 1, 2, verse 14, and chapter 2, verse 1. However, in Isaiah 26, 18, the phrase people living or dwelling upon the earth refers to all people except those devoted to the Lord, i.e. heathen people, non-believers. And this expression is clearly the intended meaning when we look at other times as it is mentioned in the book of Revelation. Revelation 6, 10, 8, 13, 13, 8 and verse 14 and Revelation 17, verse 8. The pagans upon the land, the earth, will now be put to the test through judgments to see if they will repent which of course is what God requires and is wanting them to do however the Christians on the earth will also be put to the test through persecution <laughs> Revelation 13 8 also states that the only people who worship the beast will be those whose names that were not written in the book of life before the foundation of the world now such a phrase <laughs> being written in the book of life before the foundation of the earth can upset a lot of people as it denotes that God has already predetermined who will be saved or negatively even who will not be saved. And this raises lots of questions of predestination versus foreknowledge. I, does God predestine people to be saved and to be damned or is it down to God's foreknowledge of knowing who and who doesn't choose him? I think we need to be honest here and concede that we probably cannot truly fathom this conundrum. And the reason for this is that the scriptures testify both to God's foreknowledge of our choices as well as his predetermined will. How can both be true? Well, let's not worry about it. Let's focus. Now, this is not a cop out because I know many theologians are going, no, 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 you must answer that question. But the, the reality is I don't have time on this commentary to answer that question because the commentary is really wanting to focus on end time prophecy, not in the thought theology of foreknowledge or predestination and all that kind of stuff. So let's focus on, our, you know, let, let's not worry about these things. Let's focus on our mission on the earth as Christians by praying for the lost and evangelizing the lost and not get bogged down of whether they've been predestined or God's foreknowledge. Revelation 13, 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, this phrase is a specific calling of the Lord to be spiritually alert as to what is just being said and what is about to be said. This phrase has popped up already throughout the book of Revelation. Remember back in Revelation 2.29, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, NIV. Revelation 3.22, any with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Jesus also uses the phrase in Matthew 11.15 and Mark 4.9 and verse 23. <clears throat> Jesus is telling us and the people of the future time to listen carefully to the spiritual revelations and understand what will commence. And this then leads us into verse 10 of Revelation 13. Revelation 13.10 if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. 
The two components of this verse applies to Christians only. Firstly, if anyone is called and predestined to go to captivity, then know that if you are caught at that time, that it is actually God's will for you to go into captivity. Here, the saints destined for captivity need to persevere and hold and keep the faith at a very difficult time. If anyone kills with the sword, then with the sword he will be killed. It is possible that this verse infers that there will be Christians who will choose to take up arms at this point in history. But the voice of God is very clear here. If you do take up arms and kill, then you too will be killed and you will reap what you sow. Jesus personally warned Peter about not taking up arms. We see this in Matthew 26 verses 51 to 52. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. So verse 9 and 10 of Revelation 13 is really a stark warning and encouragement to Christians that at the rise of the Antichrist, the persecution will commence three and a half years in of his reign and for the last three and a half years of the seven he will try to wipe out Christianity through persecution and execution. At this time Jesus warns the church to patiently endure the suffering and hold to the faith. Now I appreciate this might strike fear into many but we need to understand that Jesus always warned us that we Christians will be persecuted and history has borne this out to be true. Even in our current day, Christians are enduring terrible and shameful evils against them. At the time of the future history when the Antichrist rules, it will be a very bleak time for the church. However, in turn, it will also be even more bleaker for those who reject Christ as God pours out his wrath upon them for their wickedness and atrocities against the Jews and Christians in those days. Also, remember, I'll just get my notes here, from um, Revelation chapter 9 uh, where is it somewhere um, that in Revelation chapter 9 it teaches us that the saints are protected yeah Revelation 9 verse 4 it says the angels were told not to hurt the grass of the field nor any green thing nor any tree but only men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads in other words from Revelation 9 we looked at this before um, that mankind who does not have the seal of God on their foreheads, i.e. are unbelievers, pagans, those who dwell on the earth, they will have to put up with the judgments of God. Sure, we're going to have to uh, put up with the persecutions of the Antichrist, but they will have to put up with the judgments of God. So that's something that the Christians need to be aware of in those days, because that is very important. You see, the mark of the beast protects the heathen from persecution. But it doesn't protect them from the judgments of God. But the mark or the seal of God on the saints during the time of the tribulation protects them from the judgments of God. Obviously, not necessarily the persecutions that will arise from the Antichrist. But ultimately, it's in our favour, not theirs. All right, be encouraged. Don't be afraid. Be blessed. And I'll speak to you again soon. God bless. Bye bye.